biotics unit, go to the resource center. There are other resources also which may be useful. And these are all the educational videos that are there. And uh, we would like to play the one on responsible conduct of research since it is relevant to the topic of our discussions today. Thank you. So Nupur, thank you so much. You can go ahead and play the video. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Das and Dr. D'Souza have been the best of friends since medical college. People joke that their bonding would put chemical to change. Right. Right. Oh, yes. I. So, this is the grant application I told you. Uh, it's basically on novel diagnostic tools. Oh. On diagnosing viral fever of epidemic potential. Yes. yes, I need your detailed review on this, brother. You are the only person I can trust, right? Sure. So you can mail me or you can, you know. Months after, I submitted an application for the same ground. But. Dr. Das, we have a problem. A certain Dr. D'Souza has submitted an identical grant application a month ago. Dr. D'Souza, yes, I know him. In fact, I have given him my application to know his views of it. Dr. Das, please don't lie and embarrass yourself any further. Dr. D'Souza, please come in. Ma'am, I think uh, this is a case of blatant plagiarism. He stole my idea. Dr. Das, if this accusation is proven true, you will lose your role of principal investigator in currently ongoing studies. And you will not be able to participate in any other research activities for the next five years. Do you follow me? Dr. Das was indeed terminated and went into depression. Dr. D'Souza couldn't help but feel guilty for what they have done. Plagiarism is the wrongful appropriation and stealing and publication of another paper or another author's language, thoughts, ideas, or expressions. Duplicating one's own publication is called self-plagiarism. Research misconduct is fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism in proposing performing or reviewing research or in reporting research results. Dr. Susa had continued researching influenza and was collaborating with an overseas research lab. Thank you. When Dr. Susa received a copy of the published journal, he noticed that the foreign research lab had completely omitted his name as one of the lead authors. For the first time, Dr. D'Souza could come to him. The rage and the sorrow of his dear friend must have felt. Perhaps nothing is more precious than ethics and ethical. Researchers should follow guidelines of Thank you so much. And it was just a small introduction Excuse before me. I begin I'm my uh, talk today. And I'm happy to be amongst all of you and uh, people joining from across the country. And uh, maybe I'll share my screen. Uh, you know, these uh, videos have been prepared uh, internally. The actors are our own staff, short in. NCDIR, <laughs> and uh, so this was the we did this during the COVID time when we couldn't do many other activities, but this was done in house. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about research and publication ethics, and uh, we all know understand that we are all human beings. You know, we have primary interests, we have secondary interests, and we do have flaws. We are after all, we are humans, we are not perfect. And uh, we have temptations to cheat, fabricate, falsify, plagiarize at different point of time because of different reasons, pressures, which may be, uh, you know, which we cannot always say that uh, everything is all rosy all the time. And there are uh, problems that keep happening 
time to time there is a pressure to produce results and there are so many pressures and how do we deal with those things is what we have to keep on improving ourselves and we need a system a mechanism that will minimize the occurrence of this any kind of scientific misconduct and also we need mechanisms to deal with it responsibly if it has occurred at any point of time and in that hope the IC icmr came up with a special section uh, a full chapter uh, on responsible conduct of research when the guidelines were revised and published in 2017 and in addition icmr had prepared a policy on research integrity and publication ethics in 2019 which has laid the road map to a uh, research integrity and publication ethics the guidelines talk about the basic principles autonomy beneficence non maleficence and justice and the scope of guidelines extends to biomedical health research as well as socio behavioral research being done on human participants or on their samples or on their data or clinical information or any other kind of data that belongs to individuals so we need to respect the principles of ethics in any kind of biomedical health research and that includes clinical research if it is being conducted the various sections of the guideline that are there these are the 12 sections and uh, like i said a full section number 3 is on responsible conduct of research and i urge all the members to kindly go through it i have also shared some uh, reading material and some other guidelines besides the icmr guidelines which may be of relevance uh, to read more about uh, publication ethics and i hope the organizers will be able to share the same with all the participants so basically what is responsible conduct of research so we would like to promote the aim of scientific inquiry foster a research environment a good environment to work and in the process also build public confidence and therefore planning and conducting research reviewing and reporting research responsible authorship and publications are all important often a time when we talk of uh, uh, you know ethics we talk about either prior to conduct of research which is you know ethics review etc or we talk about publication ethics which means you know when you are trying to publish a paper what are the ethics requirement but you know the main thing is about planning and conducting research how this research is going to be conducted so it's very important that this the ethics a uh, requirement uh, extend right from the conception of an idea to planning conduct uh, how you do the research and then when you review the research report the outcomes of the research and try to write up a paper or a report and publish it with responsible authorship so it's a whole full line of things and follow there's a need to follow the ethical standards at every level to ensure high quality and research integrity is extremely important it's just doing the right thing when even when no one is watching as defined by uh the office for research integrity in the us fostering scientific integrity what do our guidelines say guidelines are talking about using scientific methods for your research so even how you are conducting research unless you do that that means otherwise there is there may be a lack of scientific integrity so it's very important for your research methods to be correct focus <laughs> on ethical conduct so it's about the approvals informed consent and the processes that are involved the research should be done in a manner that it is reproducible the results should be reproducible and it should be done using following a protocol so transparent procedures have to be in place there need to be communication skills in conducting research and in communicating the outcomes of research peer review processes which are fair publication of both positive and negative results it's not just positive that needs to be published and rigorous and comprehensive evaluation criteria at each and every step so what can an individual do a person a scientist a researcher at their own level so they need to be competent that's the basic underlying principle with their experience knowledge skills etc intellectual honesty in proposing performing reporting research accuracy in representing contributions cooperation in scientific interactions communications sharing resources 
declarations of conflicts of interest, protection of participants, and adhering to the mutual responsibilities that are there. And at the level of institution, good mentoring, good leadership, which supports research, uh, responsible research, encouraging research, uh, respect and collaboration, implementation of policies and adherence to the rules, anticipate, reveal, manage individual and institutional conflicts of interest, timely thorough inquiries for any allegations of misconduct, opportunities for investigators to receive training or education and institutional commitment to support integrity in research. So these are some of the fundamental aspects that need to be looked at. And therefore, for any research which may have good quality, transparency and accountability, it needs to be conducted by people who are competent. The whole research team together needs to display the confidence of doing that work in terms of their qualification, experience, and training. Being sensitive to the requirements, the social requirements, the cultural requirements, the values of the community on whom the research is going to be done, and building trust. Meaningful research, be accountable. What happens, we need to be accountable for that. Protecting participants from harm. Good mentorship, guidance from uh, senior investigators, to tell them and uh, monitor them and guide them because we've seen a lot of cases which have come to news and a lot of time uh, many students or young researchers may be doing things without knowing it. It's not that they're they are knowingly doing it. They don't know about it. So it, it's very important to tell them about how research can be conducted honestly and reported honestly. Peer review, there are various challenges at that level, which needs to be really fair, independent, and to be done in a time-bound manner, because researchers need to publish quickly. And therefore, this timeliness is also very important at each and every stage. The data, the raw data needs to be kept securely for a few years till you, after your research is completed. Well, if there are any collaborations and appropriate agreements need to be signed, whether it is material transfer agreements or a memorandum of understandings need to be there so that there is clarity in the way collaboration is and registering with the required authorities if you need to register your study on the CTRI platform. And that is again to promote independence and uh, bring in more transparency. Now conflicts of interest are also there all the time. It's very hard to say there will be no conflicts of interest because Conflicts of interest exist at all levels, whether it is at the level of researchers, whether it is level of the ethics committee, or it could be even at the level of the institution. And therefore, institution at each level, there is a lot of work and effort that is needed to take care of these conflicts of interest. So there must, institutions must therefore develop and implement policies, SOPs, and commitment plans to tackle these conflicts of interest and monitor how research is getting conducted. It is not just an approval from an ethics committee and now you know, one can do anything. There, is, there has to be a monitoring plan at the institutional level that whether the research is being conducted fairly as envisaged. Encourage independence of ethics committee without putting any undue pressure on the ethics committee because we have seen in many institutions it happens that uh, institutional authorities put pressure on the ethics committee for approving or disapproving uh, any particular research. So those things have to be avoided at all costs and appropriate declaration and management of conflict of interest should be done at the level of researcher. So all the documents that are submitted to the ethics committee must include these disclosures. Conduct research as a responsible scientist, prevent intellectual and personal conflicts, do not serve as re reviewers for grants and publications submitted by a colleagues, relatives, or friends in order to be as fair as possible. And similarly, ethics committee need to evaluate these conflicts and to take appropriate action to mitigate them. And if they have a conflict of interest themselves in the committee, they are investigator of a project or they are uh, you know, uh, advisor to uh, any kind of study, then they must disclose it when that project is being uh, reviewed and make appropriate suggestions for management if conflicts of interest are detected. 
However, despite taking all these steps, there may be research misconduct. So what is research misconduct, which is fabrication, falsification, or plagiarism in proposing, in performing, or in reviewing research, or in reporting the results. So this is a lot of things actually. So let's look at the types of these research misconduct. So fabrication and falsification, I'll come to it later in detail. Plagiarism, problematic data, presentation or analysis, you know, skewed kind of taking some uh, data and ignoring certain other data, or even your failure to obtaining ethical approval or informed consent, that also is a research misconduct. Inappropriate claims of authorship, duplicate publications of already published uh, data, and then undisclosed conflicts of interest. This also comes under research misconduct. Now, who might conduct? This can happen at every level, any stakeholder, whether it is the authors and researchers, which is mostly people think it is only at this level, but then this misconduct could even be at the level of reviewers or editors of journals or funders or publishers because these conflicts are of so many types. So there are so many competitive pressures that are there. Now, research misconduct causes could be individual circumstances. You're in a pressure, you have to submit your result. Your, somebody's thesis is due, somebody's publication is due, somebody's, uh, you know, some award or some grant is uh, to be uh, completed quickly. There could be some individual level circumstances, you know, the circumstances that are forcing a person to be, to do uh, scientific misconduct. Or sometimes it could be an individual psychology that you have, for example, you truly believe in your theory, which you want to prove in your data, but your data is not showing it. But you are in a pursuit or your mind is blocked in a manner that you would like to uh, skew your result analysis. And we all have heard that uh, the way a statistical analysis could really, I mean, you could decide how you would like to do your statistics and accordingly prove your theory. So we all know about it. So we need to be very careful uh, about how we do our analysis very fairly. Sometimes poor mentorship. So mentors are not guiding the student properly and or uh, the junior investigator. It can happen at senior level also. I'm, I don't mean that it's only at a junior level that this happens. It can, can happen at any level. Then uh, inadequate training can often be the cause because they don't understand the implications of that. You, you, you're writing up wrong results or hooked up data or results which could really have big implications for future. So there could be competitive pressure also because you are in competition with other investigators and there's a hurry for this. So publication, coming to publication aspect, uh, research fraud is publishing data or conclusions that were not uh, generated by experiments or observations, but by invention or data manipulation. Fabrication is therefore cooking up or making up your data, you know, trying to uh, make up uh, results or trying to misinterpret the results, you know, analyzing them in a manner that, you know, the way you would like to it. So the intention is to deceive so, or maybe, you know, reporting experiments that you have never conducted. So cooking up basically. On the other hand, when we look at falsification, it's basically manipulating, you know, making uh, some changes in your data to make it more robust or statistically significant or manipulating images or your tables, or equipment or changing or omitting certain results in an accurate way, beautification of your results, you know, because you want to publish it. And then uh, self-citation, duplication or multiple submissions or using shortcut methods or improper authorship. So all of these are uh, topics which are covered under publication ethics. But uh, also I like to point you that sometimes we all are human beings and we are scientists and we do make honest mistakes or which are, you know, we may have a difference of opinion. We may have a different methodology that we have followed. So there may be honest mistakes also, but uh, we would not like to consider that as a misconduct. 
coming to the criteria for authorship, we've all heard about uh, authorship being, you know, uh, you know, guest authorship, or you would like to give authorship to seniors, and that has been a challenge uh, from time immemorial, probably. So the ICMJ guidelines have given out the criteria for authorship. These are the four criteria. One is that the, all the authors should have substantially contributed to the study. Uh, I think um, somebody's mic is on. If you could please. Uh, okay. So substantial contribution to the study conception, design, data acquisition, analysis, and interpretation. So being involved at each stage, drafting and revising the article for intellectual content, not just editorial corrections, approval of the final version and taking responsibility, agreement to be accountable for all aspects of the work related to accuracy and integrity of any part of the work. So honorary or gift authorship is, you know, naming HODs and, you know, I had been handling STS for a long time in ICMR headquarters and students would often complain that their guide becomes the first author for their research. Or sometimes the guide is putting names of other uh, members uh, because, you know, these are honorary or gift authorships they would like to uh, give to many a people who have never contributed to that research. Um, increasing, you know, uh, sometimes these are senior people, you know, you like to invite a senior person uh, because, you know, that increases your chances of publication because these people may be opinion leaders, you know, they are very senior and their paper may get easily accepted if you are uh, putting their name. So senior uh, authors are there. And then sometimes ghost authors leaving out those who have contributed substantially, but they are not being acknowledged. Sometimes we have commercial activity. There are ghost writers, people who are just writers. They write up the papers. So many journals are now encouraging authors to describe the role of each author and actually the authors, how guidelines have, uh, ICMA guidelines say that, you know, you should decide about who will be the lead author and these things before the, your research is starting. You must have a clarity and not that later start arguing he should be the first author or he should be the second author. And who is not an author as per ICMJ um, is that somebody who has worked for the grant, for example, acquisition of funds supervision of work, you know, monitoring, minor lab support somebody has given or administrative support in conducting that research. So these contributions are not considered scientific enough for people named to be included as authors and therefore sponsors, for example. So ICMR is, for example, funding, let's say a task force study. It doesn't mean that the granting agency, the program of officers could automatically become authors if they are not involved in the scientific conduct of research. So I'm, I'm just giving you an example from the ICMR scenario. So we must see that what is the an actual contribution of uh, the individual. Or sometimes, you know, we had discussion in our ethics committee, why should ethics committee members not be uh, an author? They have contributed significantly in the review and given some uh, suggestions and revised uh, the proposal, but they are never credited for any of those. But they have not conducted research. They are not involved in the designing formulation of research and therefore they cannot. So small contributions do not count for authorship. That's what we must understand. There are many other stakeholders who are involved in some way or the other, but they are not eligible to be authors. But they can, their names, if they have really contributed significantly, could be there as contributors. So, or acknowledgement. So most journals would permit acknowledgement of contributors that do not merit authorship and a description of what was their contribution should can be published. And some authors, you know, journal has also permit use of group names. You know, you could have a group, the steering committee uh, group and all the names can be there. And uh, generally journals would like an author who's a senior member who becomes a garnenter or be responsible for the overall integrity of uh, the study results. Simultaneous submissions are not allowed. You cannot submit a paper to several journals at the same time, although it suits us because, you know, if one journal is uh, rejected and other, 
but uh, this is a requirement. You could submit uh, your paper to one journal at a time. You cannot publish it to multiple journals or should not try to publish in multiple journals. Salami publication is again considered not ethical because it's like slicing away a big protocol, you know, big study results into small bits and pieces and bringing out several papers which may not have that impact or may not be that meaningful, but you would have more publication in terms of numbers. Now, image manipulation has been in news uh, in the last few years a big time because a lot of time now with Photoshops and so many other softwares, one can, uh, you know, try to patch up. So one is that if there is a dirty image, you can clean it up or you could try to, uh, you know, make new bands. You can create at all Photoshop and create your gel uh, images or improve the quality of those images. But these manipulations are not um, the right way to do it. Plagiarism, we all discuss a lot about plagiarism, which is wrongful appropriation or stealing of another person's idea and showing it as your own idea. Um, that is plagiarism. And now we have softwares which can try to compare. It's called similarity check. So they can check the similarity of language to see if you have not acknowledged or if you have not given reference to somebody from whose uh, you know, paper you have taken some information. So, uh, but there are challenges with these online tools. These are not foolproof because once you give your paper and uh, you know, if you do the plagiarism check, we have, I've seen myself uh, doing it on a different day will give you different results. So there are a lot of challenges in these tools, but these are just one of the methods to check that there is no plagiarism involved, which is stealing of anybody's idea. So what effects the, can this kind of misconduct have? What kind of harm? So it's a lot of waste of time, efforts, and money. We have very limited research resources. And then practice and policy may be based on fraudulent research. And therefore, it may have really wrong uh, you know, outcomes in terms of public health translation. It may directly harm the research participant. It may be damaging to the carriers if your uh, misconduct is detected and even your colleagues who may be innocent also may get bad name about it. Loss of trust in journals and research, damage to institutional reputation, corruption <laughs> of the evidence base, you know, because scientific, scientists, you know, we are all held as scientists in high esteem. We do not want that this kind of a degrading may happen by one single act of somebody, it brings a bad name to the whole scientific community. So it's very important that we are all very careful. Another menace is predatory journals. These are these journals, hundreds and thousands of predatory journals. We don't have an exhausting list because the UGC tried to prepare a list, but there are so many thousands and each day a new journal is coming up. It's a business and they will publish tomorrow your paper, you pay them some money, money and you know, I think everybody gets so many mails every day, at least I get in my inbox, asking me to submit my paper in this journal and why this is good and all that. So it's very important when we check, we check that which journal are we trying to publish our paper, in. especially ICMR scientists, please do not, because we have probably negative scoring going on if you are uh, publishing in uh, such predatory journals. The ICMR right policy, which was brought out in 19, is the research integrity and publication ethics. It is again stressed upon the same points that I have discussed, but it has also given out a framework for research institutions under ICMR to have a system, to have a research integrity unit and research integrity officer appointed in each of the ICMR institutes who would be monitoring the conduct of research, making sure that publication ethics aspects are taken care of. So this is a flow chart. I'll not go through it uh, in, the, in the interest of time, but uh, it, it tells you the process, you know, how research is to be submitted, reviewed, and uh, plagiarism to be checked, to be done before it can be uh, agreed for publication. If, they, if the research misconduct is uh, detected, then what are the steps which are needed? And if not, then what are the steps that are needed? And if there are any complaints or allegations, uh, you know, for a scientist or for, for any member of the research team, then how to handle this misconduct? Because uh, these allegations, you know, because they may be false allegations and we do not want a person to be 
uh, you know, penalized or punished for no fault also. So there has to be an appropriate uh, mechanism in place that if there is a complaint, handle it in a confidential manner to investigate and make sure that this complaint has some merit before taking action and deciding the next steps. So this is the whole flow chart which describes all the process. And finally, DGICMR uh, has uh, you know, the uh, final authority in this matter for a final decision. Uh, ICMR has also prepared some uh, other books. I thought I'll take this opportunity to tell you that for uh, because many of you find ICMR guidelines very thick, uh, big book. So there is a handbook which is available, which discusses just the abstract or summarized manner, you know, the basic principles and application. So if you would like to have hard copies from us, you can download everything from the websites. But in case you want a hard copy, please feel free to write to me. Another suggestion that I keep giving all the time is that, you know, if ethics committees adopt the common form of ICMR, it will help in review process. It will help your research be reviewed quickly, expeditedly, and uh, completely. And so this is the format that have been developed. And recently, we have also developed a format for common review of multicenter research, and it may be very useful. So these are various forms, and investigators should encourage their own institutions to adopt these forms. It will help you in the process, because these are just one one page forms but they help in you in answering the relevant questions that are needed uh, by the, uh, to be, you know, that information is needed by the ethics committee before they take decision about your proposal. So it helps to reduce the time and back and forth communications, you know, you submit your proposal that they say this is incomplete and again you are asked. So it helps you in completing your submission. Another important uh, uh, initiative is taken by the National Institute of Epidemiology, Chennai, they have started an online EEC course. Of course, it was started initially for ethics committee members, but it's very well open for any researcher also to attend this course. And uh, uh, there are talks on conflicts of interest, responsible conduct of research, publication ethics, and other aspects also along with other topics that have been covered in this course. It's a completely online course and you can do it at ease from wherever you are. And you have seen one of our videos, but we have prepared many such videos on various topics, informed consent, ethics review, uh, dealing with vulnerable populations and other topics are there, uh, dealing with uh, you know, data, samples, stored uh, biological material. There are a lot of topics. So I uh, urge you to visit our website and have a look at these videos. And besides that, we have also prepared some animated videos and infographic posters. Also, frequently asked questions are available on the website, and these were the kind of uh, questions which researchers have from time to time, so I urge uh, you all to go through it. And uh, recent, the latest publication is uh, this book, the Bioethics Reference Book, uh, Biomedical Ethics Perspectives, and there are 10 sections, and I urge you again to, uh, you know, have a look at this book. It may be useful for your work. If you want a hard copy, please write to us. We will send you a hard copy. And uh, in the end, I would like to tell you that ICMR guidelines are now mandatory to be followed. And I think many of you know about it, but then still uh, it is important to keep reinforcing that uh, the guidelines have to be uh, followed and uh, now action can be taken because it's legally binding on researchers to follow the ICMR guidelines and for ethics committees also to review research as per the ICMR guidelines. And in the Department of Health Research, a portal has been created, uh, which is called the NETIC portal, on which all ethics committees need to be registered. It's very important to follow this. And these were some of the references, which uh, I need to give references for my talk. And thank you all. This is just a glimpse of a lot of publications that are available on our website. And I urge you all to visit our website and uh, have a look, download, and write to us if you need hard copies. And I'll be happy to... Um, you know, answer to your queries and questions. Thank you. Okay, I can read uh, some, uh, some questions. And the last one I see, ICMI is a funding agency. This is a common sentence anyone can use. Absolutely right. There are a lot of sentences and we have ourselves faced the similar thing. Like, for example, I write the title of uh, national ethical guidelines in some of the papers and it will call it as plagiarism. You know, because the similarity check would say that, you know, this is 
So we have to be reasonable when we do this. And these softwares have this tool that if you put a certain text like this, which are, you know, language which you use routinely. For example, in uh, NCDR, they have to give reference to the cancer registry portal or cancer registry. So, uh, so we put it in uh, inverted commas so that uh, the software has this inbuilt provisions to uh, ignore those statements which you can identify. These softwares can identify. You can feed in those statements which are commonly used which are really, uh, you know, you have to give the titles of certain things. You have to give the name of your institute, for example. So these are, uh, are also caught in your similarity. Uh, so uh, we can put them in inverted. And also your research integrity officer in your institution who will do the plagiarism check or do the similarity check can actually feed in some of these, which we have done in our in NCTR, we have done that. We have put all those, uh, you know, fed into the software so that when the software checks, it will omit out those uh, results. Okay, the other question, if we have taken the sentences from an article and quoted reference, will it still be called plagiarism? Um, no, you have to acknowledge and give the reference to that. Yeah, I, I don't think that will be plagiarism, but then, you know, you have to press, see again, uh, here it doesn't mean you have to just reproduce, you know, unless it's a, a definition which you need to reproduce. But otherwise, if you are uh, sharing a concept, a theme, then you need to write it in your own words and give the reference. You are not sort of supposed to copy word by word uh, from any paper, you know, unless it's a definition where you cannot change the words. So then again, you have to give uh, it in quotes where you are giving uh, such, if you are taking completely, then you have to give it in quotes. Okay. Okay. How